went through focus ion beam in a previous lecture that what it is basically is a ion uh, is a fo ions uh, charged ions which we can focus on a small area and then they can be used to write on a surface they can be used to drill and uh, I already shared this paper with you right where we have uh, is one of my previous uh, articles where we have actually made a, uh, these nanopores in silicon dioxide uh, membranes and we also use a TMH etching uh, for that in order to make that membrane and I, I hope everyone has went through that article now so that's why I'm just going through it uh, a little bit quickly if you have not get a chance to actually go through that paper I would suggest you to do it now it's already on a canvas uh, and then uh, first we drill a pore uh, and this pore was drilled with the focus ion beam so you really focus the ion beam in a small area and you look at the size. So this size is about, I don't know, about 400 micrometer because scale bar is 100 nanometer. So, and this will be 400 nanometer. And it's very small, 400 nanometer is very small. In this image it looks big, but it's not. And then we started, um, we discovered a method uh, that uh, if we heat those devices at a high temperature, but more than 1000 degrees centigrade, uh, then we start that the 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 film relaxes and then the pores start getting closing and then we can close with the, with the temperature treatment we can close the pore up to even five nanometer or smaller okay and those pores have quite a few applications in um, for bioanalysis especially for dna sequencing and protein analysis and all that and uh, there are tons of uh, papers uh, People are uh, working. And there are tons of uh, tons of different groups, and also there are new companies. Oxford Nanopore is one of that, uh, who are working on with the solid state or protein-based nanopores. We'll cover this topic in more detail later, part of uh, uh, our course, hopefully after the midterm. But I just want to give you thoughts about how we can use the fabrication or ion beam to make uh, 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 pores, or maybe they might have some other applications. And this is one of the applications that we can make a pore. <clears throat> So these uh, uh, ion beams um, uh, are also used by other groups. Uh, for example, in 2001, uh, papers published in Nature where they have made an ion beam um, and uh, they drill a pore, which, and then they shrink a pore uh, again with the ion beam. So in this case, what happens? They okay, this is their device. So first, they make a membrane. Uh, the membrane is very. Uh, the process is very similar as you do team matching. So you have a silicon at the bottom then you do TMA etching to make a thin membrane here so when you make a thin membrane then you dr you can drill actually a pore here on the thin membrane so this is our argon beam you're focusing uh, on the small area and then when there is a because if you don't use a counter so they use actually a counter to count the to detect if there are there are ions coming on the other side because if you don't use a counter then uh, we just have to try different doses and see where we are getting best results. And, and then that process has not a good repeatability because every, every film has different thickness and uh, slightly different thicknesses. And every time you have to uh, try a couple of doses before getting a pore of very, uh, very specific size. But in this case, they actually um, install a sensor which will detect if there are ions coming on the other side and they can also count the ions with the equipment. So, so whenever there is an opening, they will start seeing the ions on the other side. So in that way, they can control the process uh, and they can have more uniform MITI in their diagrams, uh, in their diameter of the pore which they're getting. So first they just made a drill a pore first in a silicon nitride membrane which was 61 nanometer wide. And then, and then they have also discovered uh, that if they now decrease the uh, acceleration velocity or the uh, applied bias or energy of the ions which they are providing on the surface, in that case they can actually shrink the pores. So basically, in that case, they are providing energy to the uh, to the boundary layer. Again, that boundary layer will relax. It's a similar effect what we have in the case of thermal heating, but thermal heating more simpler. You just need a high temperature. But in this case, you can use actually a beam to really uh, soften the membrane. But if you soften it too much, then the whole thing breaks. So you have to be very careful. And then they were able to actually shrink a pore 
to sub 10 nanometer. I think this is 1.8 nanometer what they are showing here. So they can actually control the diameter of a pore uh, and they can shrink the pore with a, a focus ion beam exposure. Uh, this is one of the um, <clears throat> very common way to shrink pores and, uh, and people are using, people also using electron beam actually to shrink a pore. They provide energy with electron beam and then they shrink a pore. Can, can anyone, anyone of you give me an answer that we have argon ion which we're using to drill the pore here, right? But there's also electron gun shown here, right? So why we need electron gun there, by the way? Do you have an idea why we might need electrons on the surface. Although we are not using electron, we want to just use our argon ions, right? And because it's an ion beam. So we can just use uh, ions to drill a pore. To neutralize, right? The extra ions. Extra ions, yes. The... Yes, so what happens at the start when you start drilling? So the ions will be hitting on the surface and uh, and they will not make it through the membrane right away. So they will damage the membrane. It will take some time, a uh, few seconds actually, for them to drill a pore. But when, and, and, and the organs are actually positive charge, right? So when you start dumping charge on the surface and the new organs will come and they will not be then, uh, they will be deflected into one or other direction. So in that way, your pore geometry will not be uniform and you might get a larger pores than what you would be expecting. So, but if you have electron gun there and we continuously shower electrons there, uh, that will make sure that the argons which are after their impact, they will be neutralized, okay? And uh, once they are neutral, then the uh, incoming, further incoming uh, argon will not be deflected to the side. So, uh, so that's very important. And I told you that the similar thing happened when we image anything with the scanning electron microscope, SCM, where we shower electrons on the surface and uh, and what happens that um, the electrons are actually, and we get a secondary electrons that we discussed, and those secondary electrons are um, detected with a detector, and how they are getting deflected from different areas, we actually make a pattern, okay, this is how the surface should look like, and then we draw the uh, diagram. The computer does it for you. The software does it, they make an image of, based on the uh, uh, amount of secondary electrons coming from different areas. So, but in that case, because if the, your sample is not conductive, especially when we are working with the biosamples, like human uh, cells um, or any thing which has a protein in the surface, they are all polymers, and they are not really conductive. They are conductive, it's not like they are not fully insulators, but yes, but they are not good conductors. So, so what happens when you start looking them, so basically you cannot put a cell right away under the microscope. You have to do some treatment, uh, so make sure the cell and the, or the surface is prepared and it's in a dry form, so then you can use it for under the SCM. Uh, but yes, now let's say if you sample, and if you see it on the SCM, at the start you might be able to see something on the surface, but with the time, then you will start getting a uh, flash on the surface. Let me show you some how the flash looks like, and then you'll have a better, uh, better picture of uh, So for example, if you look at this image, you will see that in here, the image is not clear. You see a glare there, right, on the surface there. It's a very bright here. And, uh, but in this case, okay, no, I don't wanna go there. In this, the, in this image, you will see that the, the, we can see some details, but again, on certain areas, it's the charging. That's called the charging effect. Because you already have electrons, if the, if the if the surface is not conductive, and uh, and if you shower electron on the surface, right, expose it to electrons, the electron will start depositing on the surface, and when the new electrons will come, they will be reflected back, so they will not be able to actually eject further second electrons because of a charge. And uh, but if the surface is conductive, what happens? Then you have a ground there. So whatever electrons you are putting there, you have, with the ground they will go to the ground, and in that way there will be no more electrons on the surface, you can have a very nice image. So, but when you have a non-conductive materials, then uh, this happens. 
but let me show you now SEM image of gold let's say nanoparticles which are very really small so these particles are so this is 500 so this one is 50 so these are 50 nanometers and you can look at how how much resolution how much greater resolution we can get with this scanning electron microscope and these particles see we can also see the different facets of uh, that uh, it looks like some crystalline form of uh, uh, gold uh, but uh, you can see how much detail we can see with these particles there might there are quite a few options any 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 image you will see uh, it will be very nice and the reason is because it's a conductive material but if it's a cell or any other let's look at this one look at the fine detail which you can get but it's a large image but we can still see how much fine detail we can see with the scanning electron microscope we don't see any charging there right but previously we were seeing the charging and the reason is the electron exposure and and then after some time it start deflecting the electrons which are coming so you will not be able to actually eject further scanned electrons and, and you will see that charging because of the reflection now the the thing is how how do you think we can and that's why we use actually electron gun here uh, because we're using argon so we use electron gun uh, to mitigate that charging effect in the focus ion beam but in the case of a scanning electron microscope where we use the electrons to expose the surface and to take an image what do you think can be solution of that charging effect how we can get rid of that charging any thoughts Uh, when we use SCM, right? So I, I've shown you some images that we see some charging when the, especially when the uh, sample is not conductive, and uh, so we cannot see things in much more detail with the high resolution. So how do you think we can get away, or we can reduce that charging effect? What you would like to do to reduce the charging effect? So one is very straightforward. Now you can use the ion beam, maybe there and shower some positive ions so that will always make the surface neutral right so that's the one way to improve it and then there are some uh, good SCM microscopes which where they have had some positive charges so they dump those charges or ions on the surface and that makes the surface uh, neutral and you can see things in much more detail but that's less commonly used method although uh, I've seen it in one or two microscopes but mostly it's not there but there are some other ways people use it to uh, to image, uh, uh, do you have any thoughts like how we can image? This was one way, right? So one, th what's the goal? We want to make surface conductive, right? If the surface is conductive, then we'll not see charging effect. So how we can make surface conductive? So why not we can deposit a very thin layer of, let's say, gold? Okay, or platinum, very thin, maybe five nanometers on the surface. Let's say if you have cells, which are 10 micrometer around that diameter, or five micrometer, which is big, and we deposit a very thin layer of, let's say, five to 10 nanometer of gold, mm -hmm. even carbon, which is conductive, and we deposit that thin layer on the surface, and uh, then you, if you image the um, sample under the microscope, then you should be able to see it with much more detail without any charging because of now you have made the surface conductive okay but definitely you will not because it's a very thin layer if there is a particle which is let's say five nanometer and you want to see it and you coat five nanometer on top of it then it will not be good right but mostly uh, with the cells and other things which are non-conductive they are a little bit larger in size so we may be able to see it with the microscope but let's say if we want to see something which is a uh, 10 nanometers and it's non-conductive so how we can then image it definitely we cannot use SCM for sure there are other options available for example atomic force microscope where you have a small thin cantilever and you actually look at the surface right in that case there is no charging phenomena it's more physical phenomena you go on the surface and see if there is something there okay so you scan the surface like a profile emitter and if there is something on the surface it will uh, just uh, be the, the cantilever will be raised and then it will come down and because of that uh, movement of a cantilever you will see different reflections. So then you have a laser actually I will show you an image it's coming up 
So you can use the AFM actually to image anything which is non-conductive or conductive. Okay, so you can use that maybe for that case. <clears throat> but coming back to other lithographic techniques, um, and there's another, uh, there are quite a few methods which are called scanning probe lithography. In a scanning probe lithography, we can, we use normally the small tip like a atomic force microscopy and small tip and they can scan the surface. And we can do many different jobs with that. So in one example, we can do chemical and molecular patterning and that's called the dip pin nanolithography. We'll go through it in more detail today. We can also do mechanical patterning. Let's say if you have a small tip and you want to write it on the surface, you can scratch it, you can do nano indentation or you can also check the surface rigidity, the small tip on the surface. We can also, if you have a small tip, you can also go to small area and you can provide a local heating there. You can also provide a, some voltage bias only on a small area on your surface, right? With the small tip, which is on nanometer scale. So you can do many different things. And if you can <clears throat> provide heating on a small area, then it means you can maybe uh, expose a resistor on a small area, right? Or you can also uh, maybe oxidize or deposit something because now you have you, you have a power and capability to locally heat or provide voltage bias to a very small area, let's say nano, nanometer scale resolution, because with the tip, and so, and that can be, that energy can be used to actually do many different things, to scratch or to write something on the surface. This is how the atomic force microscopy look like. So this technique is actually used for Imaging also, like in scanning electron microscope. So scanning electron microscope is used for imaging, and it's also used for lithography. In the same way, the atomic force microscope is used for imaging, and it's also used for lithography. It really depends what you want to do with the with the system, and it requires slight few modifications, and then you will be able to get the do the task. So in this case, if you see there is a cantilever here, which is the main thing which is used to actually write on the surface. Or that will approach the surface a certain area. So you have a cantilever, okay, and then and then there is a tip, and that's actually made up of a silicon nitri uh, nitride. In this case, it is also made up of silicon other silicon-based materials. Uh, depends on it has different applications based on what material you are looking at. Uh, this tip. Uh, can be made up of different materials. Because if your surface is very soft, then you may not want to use a very hard tip because then it can scratch the surface while it's imaging it, right? So we have to choose a tip which is compatible with your surface which you want to image. And then we have a one laser here. Let's say in this, in this case there's a laser which is uh, focused on the top of this tip here. Okay, so the laser is focused and after and the and this tip ha has a reflection coating on the surface, so the laser will be reflected, and it will be detected with a photosensitive detector on this side. So, what happens when the tip is now in this way? You will get some reflection, but now if the tip is bent, you will get a reflection, but it will be the reflection would be focused onto a different area on the detector. So, in that way, you can see if the tip is bent or if tip is not bent. And that helps you actually, then you use that information to, to estimate, okay, how the surface should look like, where tip is bending or not bending. From there you can actually draw a very nice image of a surface based on this profile. And now, because now you have a tip and you have a very good piezoelectric positioner or a piezoelectric scanner, which helps to scan the surface. So you apply, do you know what is piezoelectric? Material so piezoelectric material is the one where you, when you apply voltage it swells. Okay, so that's a property of the material. So if you pro provide some voltage to that material, it swells. It increases its size. And on the other hand, if you press that material, then you can produce voltage also. So there's two ways. So it's a mechanical to electrical conversion. Okay, that's a piezoelectric. So, and it, it finds a lot of applications in, a, in, a, in semiconductors also, in a biomedical. It really depends what you want to use. Uh, but in this case, uh, the piezoelectric material is used to actually control the stage. 
So let's say because you need a very fine movement of a stage or sample, so you apply a certain voltage that will either expand uh, your uh, actuation mechanism and then your stage will move slightly, but you have a very fine control. Uh, you can read more about uh, especially this uh, AFM example by going through this paper. I always try to give most of the references, so if you want to read more about a specific topic, you can go to that article and then maybe go through it in much more detail. Uh, but this is how the AFM works basically. And now with the tip, you have much better control. The tip itself, this tip, the 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 tip ha is very sharp, and the diameter at this place is about 100 nanometer or even smaller. So means the, if it's a smaller diameter, then you can really see small things. If the tip is thick, then you cannot see. It will definitely will not have a resolution, right? Because then it will not distinguish if it's a five nanometer particle is there or not because the tip is large. And if the surface is rough and you have a pattern which is a um, let's say 10 nanometer uh, uh, roughness and uh, surface radiations that you can only see if your tip uh, head is very very small maybe five nanometer then it can go inside and scan the surface another thing about the afm that when you start using a tip uh, you know it's contacting a surface there are two modes it's called the tapping and non-tapping mode but we'll not go into those details but basically it, it comes very close to the surface or even touches it when it touches the surface and if you're scanning it, you can understand that after a certain time, the tip diameter will start increasing, right? Because of the surface roughness, uh, and, uh, and the the tip diameter will change, uh, will uh, uh, it will start getting increased, or the sharpness will reduce, uh, and then and then with the time, after certain scans, you will not be able to actually get a very nice image. So then you have to use a tip. So these tips doesn't work forever. So after certain images, you have to remove it and then install a new tip, and they are not very cheap also. Um, maybe the silicon nitro tips, I think you can get maybe eight or 10 of them, or six, I believe we got it from three, $400 at one time. So so they are expensive. But yeah, again, but sometimes you, AFM is the only option which can be used to uh, image something or look at something, and you can, now you can, see that if you have a small tip, you can really go to certain places and locally heat the area, right? You can locally remove certain material from the surface with the, even with the tip scratching. It has a very nice resolution. I'll show you some images today, how nice it can image with the AFM. And, uh, and you can also locally um, deposit a material. You can locally heat up a material and uh, remove it. It really depends what you want to do with that. But this is some of the description which I, we already discussed, so I'll not go through it, uh, you can read it. It's the same thing which I discussed with you. In AFM, I'll show you some plot here. It's a nice movie which shows you how the AFM is used actually to image the surface. Although we kind of discussed it, but uh, I'll show you. And and it will show you the graph here once we start plotting. Let me show you for one time, and then so this is actually a deflection. So this graph is called force distance curve. So this is a force distance curve. So they will be getting some curve soon. So this is the distance, how small, how close we are coming to your sample. So right now it's a far, right? Maybe far. So right now it's a 10 or maybe 20 angstroms away, maybe two nanometer away. As the tip will come close to the surface, okay, the this line will be moved to this direction right so you are coming close so this is your surface so you are coming close to the surface and when you touch the surface after that you keep coming closer so you keep applying force that's why it's a force this uh, deflection curve or force distance curve so when you at this stage when you press it more now you will see that the tip will start bending right it's a flexible when it start bending you can see, you can find out how much is being deflected from the uh, laser deflection, which you're getting, right? How, at one angle, it is deflecting laser. So now let's look at the video first before, and then and then we'll I'll talk more a little bit about it.
Okay, now think about it. If the material on which you are pressing your tip is hard or soft, will you see a different kind of a reflection? Yes. Now you can imagine, right? You will see a different reflection. The tip bending will be different if it is a softer material or not. So basically from this force, this distance curve, you can find or the Young's modulus or the hardness of a material, any material, even a cells. People have used the AFM in a lot of papers to look at the flexibility of uh, different kind of cells and, and they have reported quite a few times in literature. There are many papers. Actually, there was a talk uh, yesterday by Dr. J. N. Reddy. He's at Texas a m So there was a seminar. Um, uh, and his work also was about finding the mechanical forces involved in the AFM or when you look at the mechanical properties of a human cell as compared to a cancer cell. It's, uh, <coughs> it's reported in the literature. <coughs> Excuse me. It's reported in the literature that the dead and live cells have different elasticities. It's also reported that cancer cells and normal cells have different elasticities. So if that is true, it means we can use this method to differentiate cells based on their elasticity or mechanical properties. Okay, now how efficiently those parameters are distinguishable, that's debatable. Some cells, based on my own understanding, some cells, and uh, I have worked in this area a little bit, some cells actually show very clear differences in elasticity. For example, I know in the bladder cancer, some of the bladder cancers are actually more than 20 times more elastic as compared to the uh, normal cells. Because cells have to be elastic, uh, many cases, the cancer cells, but some cancer cells actually become rigid. So it's not a universal property, and you can find that in literature. But in some cases where the cells are elastic, okay, how we can differentiate whether the cell is a cancerous or not, by the way? Any one of you, maybe someone from a bio background, maybe they may be able to tell us. How we can say if there's a cell, and how we can differentiate how the person who are working, path, who are working in pathology, how can they can tell whether this is a cancer cell or not cancer cell? But how we define a form, right? So, so some cells might be at the early stages. This shape would be very similar to the normal cell. The cell doesn't have a very defined shape, right? Sometimes if it's a late stage cancer, the cell becomes a little bit larger many times and their shape is very rough. As compared to the normal cells, they look more rounded on the surface. But that's kind of a qualitative analysis, right? Don't some of them produce enzymes like telomerase? That their Again, telomerase activity sometimes is very well expressed on certain cancer cells, but uh, but this is not a definitive marker. Maybe you at the early stage you may not be able to see that. The the success of or the sensitivity of the pathology normal which we do in labs is about seventy percent or lower. Maybe thirty percent or more cases we cannot really differentiate. Uh, correctly whether it's a cancer or not. So it's a, you can look at the genetics also, right? So you can, you can sequence the uh, cells. It will take some effort to do that. Again, there's such a high variability in the expression of the genes and some cancers, we scientists have found some specific genes if they're present. So then there are chances that the person might, the cell might be cancerous. Okay, what yes. What mechanisms do our own immune system use to differentiate? Oh, the cancer cells, we cannot really, uh, that's a problem. If our immune si system differentiates that these are not normal cells, they will kill it. But the cancer cells behave or disguise such that they tell our immune system we are normal. Everything is fine. So they start growing with the time and then the one of the big problem in the cancer, one of the biggest problem in the cancer is they metastasize from one, or they move from one place to other place. And that's one of the big challenge why we cannot actually remove a cancer. Otherwise, if someone has a cancer here, you can take this part off, right, uh, in one case, and then you can get rid of a cancer. The other human body is fine. But the problem is many people, when they have a cancer, it's not localized. 
you start traveling from one place to the place. Look at it. If someone has a bladder cancer and later on they discovered uh, now this person has developed a brain tumor because those cells move from or lung lung cancer move from one area to the other area. Although the bladder and the lungs are two very different organs. Their cells are different, but so it means how come the cell which is not from that origin is able to survive in a different environment, right? So the cancer cell definitely might have went through some transition where it has actually become a stem cell. Stem cell can differentiate into many different forms. So the, it's called the cancer stem cells. So now it's a stem cell, now it can go there and it can, it can become a new cell type. So it can become a uh, lung, lung cell and, uh, and then uh, it will develop there. But now the thing is we have a small veins and uh, capillaries also in our body. So how come these cells manage to move through the body to different places? through the blood most probably, right? Because bladder is different location and the lungs are different locations. How come they can move there? So definitely uh, they might have been transported through the blood, right? And they might have passed through very thin openings and the cells, if they are larger, uh, then they have to be flexible. I'm just giving you one rational why the cells, they have to be flexible. So they have to modify their structure Actually, there are quite a few filaments inside which give a structure, rigidity to a cell. And those filaments have to reorganize themselves to, to become more flexible. And, and then you would be able to, uh, uh, they would be able to actually pass through very small uh, barriers. And, and I have, let me see, I, I think I have one paper about it where, uh, uh, okay, let me see. I can show you some nice image. Yeah, it just came to mind. Yes. Like when the uh, cancer takes it into more cells, right? You just mentioned that those cells are like very flexible. So most of the time when the cancer takes it into more cells, they're like larger in size. What if they skip through the chemical and like, develop some more plastic? I'll I'll get back to your question. Just hold on that right now. Okay, I'll I'll get back to you in a minute. Let me see if I can uh, show you one example. Uh, so in this case, the cancer is, uh, is shown as larger. Okay, uh, this is the one device which we used, uh, but I don't see the image which I want you to actually show you here. But uh, let me see if I can. Uh, I think this was another paper. Uh, show more. Okay, so these are, so this plot shows that, so these are bladder cancer cells, okay, very interesting uh, experiment. So these are bladder cancer cells, and these are normal urethral cells, which are actually normal bladder cells. So if we seed so this is a, these are microfluidic channels, which you cannot see very clearly maybe, but there are channels here. Okay, they're wider from one side, so they're wider from the inlet, and then they become smaller, so maybe it's more clear here. So they're wide here, and then they become thinner and thinner. I think the, at this side, they are about five micrometer. It's just very small. Now we seed cells on one side, so this is their starting point, we seed cells there. And we also see cell on the other side, uh, in the case of cancer, okay? Then we'll leave it and we'll grow them for some time and we notice that as time passes, the cancer cells were able to move through those channels and they, they were migrating through these micro channels and they were able to actually go to the other side in 96 hours, which is very interesting. Okay, although their sizes are much larger, although it's not very visible here, their sizes are much larger than this, on this side, five micrometer only, the, this opening, and their sizes are about 20 micrometer. But in the same cells, 
type of cells when they were not cancerous. If you see them, we don't see actually anything which were able to move to the other side. So that what it tells you, it tells you that cancer cells have a more flexibility for sure, and they also like to move from one place to other place. Okay, and there are some other reasons, but these are more physical principles which we have noticed. And uh, if you look at the number of migrating cells in the case of bladder cancer, it was significantly higher than the normal cell. Okay, and that clearly tells you that there are better migration properties. Now, let's come back to our AFM. Let's say if we have some cell, uh, there is one way that we can actually differentiate those cells. for their mechanical properties, right? And you can locally use the AFM to find out the elasticity of that membrane of a cell locally. Uh, or it can be another material where you want to find out the uh, elasticity or hardness of the material. So AFM can be used for that purpose. If you have a miss, let's say, small nanoparticles, there is no easy way to actually mirror the flexibility of nanoparticles. But with the AFM, you should be able to do that. Okay, otherwise I don't know how you can image, how you can measure the flexibility of the nanoparticles. Because if the materials are larger in size, then you may be able to do that. There are other equipments which are used to find your stress strain uh, curves, right? From there you can uh, find out uh, the Young's modulus and mechanical properties. But if the things are nanoscale, I don't know, there's, uh, to my understanding, there would be, uh, there is no other good way to actually find the uh, mechanical properties of the things. So the AFM is actually, very, very useful tool. Uh, now if you look at this AFM, and before it actually touches the surface right there, we see that the deflection, uh, if you look at the tip, actually, if you look at the tip, it first, if you look at the tip, it first bends upwards. When it, it is just touching the surface. Okay, I'll show it again, maybe, uh, and we look at it larger picture. Okay, it's not there. Uh, I can show you that. Okay, see when it is uh, when you are, won't take it off or when it's just touching the surface at the start. So this is now where it was just touching it, right? At the start, it was bending up, and but then once it's there, you put a force, then it start bending downwards, right? So that bending up happens because when it reaches very close to the surface, there are wonder wall forces. There are also electrostatics, which try to attract the tip towards them when it's very close to the surface. And that's why you see a downward refraction, OK? Because then the, your angle is different how it's get, uh, deflecting the uh, laser. But then after that, you start keep pushing it more, and then you'll see a regular, more regular deflection, so where it, how it should be. And that same phenomena happens when you actually want to take it off. And when it's very close to getting off from the surface, and because of those electrostatic interactions, this, this comes into play. And then you see some inertia. So it will not, so it will take some more effort actually to take those tip off from the surface. And that's why you see that while it's taking off, it takes a little bit more force actually to pull it up. But, anyways, uh, now these are some of the different some of the examples where people have used and there are also references if you want to learn more about any of those they have used AFM to write different things on the surface uh, and uh, in this case it's molecular writing so they have used some molecule actually to write on the surface and look at the thickness of this uh, line 15 nanometer only such a great resolution with this system. In this the scale is not visible, but you can use a tip to write magnetically on the surface. There are also some chemical modifications, which can be even a, um, uh, if you have resist and if you locally heat it up or resist or expose it with, a, with the electrons, if you apply voltage with the tip, so you can also write on the surface. And, uh, and this is one micrometer, so definitely this is a nanometer. And this is 500 nanometer, the whole scale. So definitely this line width would be 10 to 15 nanometer. And this is mechanical scratching. Means you can use a tip actually to physically write on the surface. So uh, there are quite a few advantages 
which this EFA microscope brings. Uh, but there are also some disadvantages. So what can be, what are the disadvantages or limitations, I would say, of the, this technology? So one I already discussed, that the tip need to be replaced after some time, right? Because it will start getting, uh, because of a friction, it start getting rounded on the tip surface and you will have a larger tip later on, so you have to replace it, it's expensive. What else? In terms of uh, why not we use the tips to write on the surface, right? We can have nano features. That's true. So yeah, for applications, especially in electronics or uh, uh, where we want to make uh, millions of things on the surface, and uh, it's the throughput, throughput is the biggest issue with the AFM. Taking one image takes 15, 20 minutes. When you really want to load your sample, you want to image certain surface, it takes time. Okay, because it has a scan. And writing on the surface also takes time. With a small 10 nanometer, 15 nanometer tape, when you are, you are writing on the surface, and you want to make features in micron scale, calculate the surface area, if it's a, let's say, 200 millimeter wide uh, wafer, or your, maybe your glass slide, which is a 25 to 40, millimeter wide, so it will take time to actually write it if you want to really want to have many features. But if you just want to show that, okay, you can print things small, yes, you can do that. But yes, at certain places it will have a, quite a few very interesting applications, and that's where people use it. You can have small features of the AFM, it can be used for imaging, and I told you that it was one company in Delray, I forgot the name again. Uh, they, they, their business is actually <coughs> to use the AFM to fix, uh, they fix the uh, photo masks, which people use for lithography, and they have nano features, and after a certain time, because of uh, some debris or something, those masks, especially the features which are nano skill, they, they get dirty, okay? Or, the, the, or those uh, lines which are opaque, they become uh, maybe broken there. So they use AFM to locally go there and fix the, that thing. Otherwise, it will be very hard to fix that specific area. So AFM can do that job very efficiently. So you can image area, find out the place, and then you can do with that. With the tip, you can do many things. Okay, and that's what they do. And uh, it's a reasonable size company. So, so they're in good midst, I think. <clears throat> There's another radiation of the AFM, atomic force microscopy. It's called the dip pen lithography. So basically, you dip a pen in ink, and then you write it on the surface. And now in this case, your pen is what? Your pen is nanoscale pen. And then we call this technology, and the paper was published in Nature Nanotechnology. So it's a very, very uh, high impact journal. And most of the most latest and most innovative research is published in Nature Science. And there are quite a few other journals also, but uh, these are most, most uh, uh, well known and uh, historical and also uh, recent literature. Most of the good papers are published in those journals. Uh, but not always the case. Uh, Sometimes people don't publish there. It doesn't mean that their work is not important. Uh, but but yes, you will find a many good signs there. Uh, and this paper was published there. And where they show the capability that they can actually use the nano tips to and use it as a pen to write it on the surface. And in this case, specific case, they use a phospholipids. So phospholipids are the molecules which our cell membrane is made up of. So I told you that in the cell membrane, it has a phospholipid molecules, which are hydrophilic and hydrophobic. So their heads are hydrophilic. They like water. Their tails are hydrophobic. So they don't like water. So in that way, they make a double layer in our cells, so such that the liking water part or their heads stays towards the water. So the inside, if you look at inside a cell, um, so they will be, your head will be facing that way, and outside the cell also the head will be facing. So they make a double layer. So let's say if this is a head, so outside it will be facing, so this is a tail, and there is another head, so they will make a double layer. So that's how they, and because of the hydrophilic and hydrophobic interaction, they manage to actually survive in that environment, in that shape. And 
like like oil for example if you put oil in a water you will see that the oil will make a small droplets and it will stay as it is it will not get mixed so in that way the phospholipid molecules because of hydrophobic and hydrophilic interaction they manage to survive in that environment okay so it means um, and i told you that people now are looking into and there are a few publications also very recent work that they are using phospholipid molecules to build nano particles so why not we can use this phenomena how our cells are made and why not we can use these phospholipid molecules to make a nanoparticles right and then what would be the advantage of using phospholipid molecules to make nanoparticles most of the nanoparticles i know they are coming inside our body and they are not biocompatible or at least we are not sure what their fate would be after a few years whether they might have some toxic effects maybe after five years or, or not so but the phospholipid molecules because our all cell human body is made up of fossil organic molecules right so why not if we use these molecules which are already biocompatible and build structures nanoparticles with that and then we can load drug inside those particles and then uh, we can target them to different locations right so then the biocompatibility will not be an issue in this case but in this paper, they use actually phospholipid molecules in the water, so, and then they put it on the tip, and the surface was, in this case, this surface, what do you think? The surface should be hydrophilic or hydrophobic? This surface, which you're seeing, where the molecules are getting arranged, right? This surface will be hydrophilic or hydrophobic? Hydrophobic. hydrophilic. Because heads are hydrophilic, Hydrophilic, hydrophilic things likes to come together. Same people likes to come close together, right? They make good friends. But the hydrophobic or hydrophobic things also likes to come together. Okay? It's the opposite to the charge. There's a positive and negative. Is That's a different phenomena. But in this case, similar uh, property like hydrophilic, hydrophilic comes together. Like oil. If you have a two, if in a big pot you have a two oil uh, droplets, once they come close, they will merge, right? They like to come close to one another. So because of that, the hydrophilic and hydrophilic part will come close, and the hydrophobic part will try to away from a hydrophilic part. And that's how it will automatically arrange in this format. And if you have an ink where they are mixed, and if you put that ink and the surface is hydrophilic, let's say, for example, gold is hydrophilic, for example, or it can be any silicon dioxide, so you can, with the tip now, you can write on the surface with these molecules. They will automatically arrange in a self-assembled monolayer, and that's called the SAM. It's, it's a term which is used many times. SAM is self-assembled monolayer. So you can actually have one single layer of those molecules on the surface by this technique. In this one, they just show the capability that they can do it. Now we have to find the applications. So there are quite a few actually tips which can be used, uh, uh, quite a few uh, options of inks which can be used, and and those inks are, it can be small organic molecules, it can be collider nanoparticles which we can actually use as an ink and write somewhere for different purpose. We can use polymers, uh, we can use organic or bio inks like a DNA, why not we can use the DNA as ink and we can put it in certain places for different purpose. We can uh, use proteins, peptides, metal lines, so you name it. So quite a few options are available which can be used as the ink, right, in this case scenario. In one example, there's another publication. What they've done is they actually make the tip such that they modified it. They, are, they make two channels around the tip. And then those channels are connected with the reservoir where you can actually fill in the ink like we have like in a pens, our pens, regular pens. So so in that way you don't really have to go and dip in the ink all the time and come back right in the same place in this way they have a more supply for the ink available which can be a phospholipid molecules or proteins or anything and they, you can continue writing on the surface okay but again there are issues with the time if you if you stop it then if the evaporating evaporates then uh, it will block the channels and all that so those issues are there but they have shown this capability. Look at this. This is the reservoir which we have made, and this is a cantilever. These are the real SM images. And this is another image of a cantilever. 
So yeah, uh, so by making the reservoir, which was an interesting um, um, uh, work, um, you can keep on writing on the surface for various applications. But the biggest challenge again with this technique is that um, the throughput is the biggest challenge. And then in this, especially when you make a reservoir, then blockage of a channel can be a problem over a period of time. These are um, some more applications where people have uh, examples. People have used uh, the deep in lithography right on the surface. So these are quite a few examples which you can go through. If you look at the resolution, so this is a 30 nanometer dot which you can write with the uh, particle. And you see how good the dots are and what it shows that if you touch a tip for a smaller period of time, let's say this is 60 seconds, 45 seconds, 33 seconds, continue to move on to 1 second, 0.5 seconds. By controlling the time, how the tip speed or the time it is spending on the surface, actually this shows a graph where by increasing the speed, actually it's a reverse graph, so by, by increasing the speed, your line thickness can increase, or in other words, it's a 1 over speed, so basically when you go that way, you're decreasing the speed. If you're coming this way, you're increasing the speed, you can reduce the line width, okay? So more speed means smaller resolution, and that's what is also being shown here. 60 seconds, if you put it in for 60 seconds, because you can dispense more liquid there, and you have, they have a very good control on that, and you can see how well defined those particles or the features are which we are writing on the surface. And again, in this image also, it's a thick, thin, thin, and with the changing the time, how, how much time it's spent on the surface, you can write thin or thick, okay? Uh, that has been done. And there is um, another way we can use atomic force microscopy or atomic force uh, tips, and it's called thermal, so thermal dip in lithography. So in this case, it's a thermal. So thermal means that we can heat those uh, cantilevers specifically on the surface, right? And that brings a lot of more possibilities of applications. So in this case, let's say uh, we have a cold tip, and then we can apply some voltage maybe to heat up the tip surface, or maybe we can apply uh, attach some heater with it. So then the tip will be heated up. So when it's heated, then it may be connected with a ink, which is in a solid form, but when you heat up the ink, when you heat up the cantilever, then the ink becomes liquid, and then you can start writing on the surface. So then you can control when you want to write, when you don't want to write. Because in the previous design, I was telling you if it evaporates and all that, but in this case, when you're not writing, your ink is in a solid form at a room temperature, but then you can actually heat up the ink and then ink or ink means anything. It can be DNA, it can be protein. So they are maybe in gel form, in a solid form. You can go through the reference in more detail. And then the ink melts. Uh, when you heat it up, then you can start writing on the surface. So there is a reference to the paper. Uh, you can write, uh, read more about it. And it's published in a JAX, which is Journal of American Chemical Society, very well-known journal also. So. This is another description of how we can use uh, thermal dip in lithography. Basically, uh, in this case, the ink was made up of uh, octa distal phosphonic acid, which is OPA. Uh, it has a high melting temperature, which is 99 degrees. So basically, it can be used um, uh, for this uh, application where it need to be heated up at 99 degrees or 100, then it will melt, right? So then it means that that uh, uh, material can be used for this application where you have a cantilever and it is uh, connected with the ink which is made up of OPA. So when you melt it to 99 degrees centigrade, then it, you can start writing it. Otherwise, uh, it will not write on the surface. Okay, and, and they have shown the capability that they can write on uh, mica, stainless steel, aluminum, oxides, and many other materials. Okay, with this uh, polymer, so it has a good adhesive property. And the resolution, which they have shown that they can write features about 98 nanometer, or yeah, that's a line width we can write with the OPA. Because that line width is also related with the tip radius. So this tip radius was, uh, the radius, uh, tip radius of curvature, the tip head was about 
100 nanometers. So that's why the resolution which you are getting is very close to 100 nanometer. If you use a tip which is actually even smaller than that, then you can you, you can improve the resolution. And when you turn off the current in this case, it will uh, the 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 heating the temperature will also decrease because there will not a heating effect. So they are using voltage or applying current like bulb when we it turns on the current passes through it, it heats up. It's the same phenomena they use it here. Actually, they heat it up the cantilever and then or making it cold. Uh, okay. So this is another example where they have actually used another polymer which is conductive. Uh, it's called the PDT. Long name is uh, maybe lengthy, so I'll not say it, but you can read it. Uh, it's a PDDT, and they have shown that you they can use a very commonly used polymer because it's conductive. They have used that right on the surface of oxide, silicon dioxide. So it means if you want to make a, a electrodes, very thin electrodes, which are maybe few nanometer or maybe 100 nanometer wide and you want specific thickness. So you can use actually this polymer, you can use a cantilever to write on the surface, right? So this is a very good application, how we can write things on a nanometer scale. Now the problem with this technology in general is definitely it's a serial process, you cannot write a lot. Uh, if you want to write larger features, it will take forever as we discussed. So uh, people have to start looking into that if we can improve the resolution by increasing the number of tips on the surface. So in this example, they use actually 10 <coughs> pen arrays, creates 10 arrays. So they use 10 different uh, cantilevers. And on each cantilever, there are, uh, there are quite a few tips available. So in that way, you may have 10 into 10 by 1,000, uh, 100 tips available at one time. In this example, there are 26 pen arrays uh, where you have in each pen, there are actually five tips on each pen. So, so this each place, there are actually one, two, three, four, five tips on each pen. So it means you have 526. You have quite a few pens available, and then you can write the whole thing to write on the surface. Okay, uniformly. Uh, that's interesting, but uh, uh, let's look at one more example in, uh, of the uh, effort to improve the uh, throughput of a system, and that's again published in Nature Nanotechnology. Uh, they have actually, so these small boxes which, which are here, they are made up of gold. So each square has 40 by 40 tips. So there are 40 by 40 tips, 40 by 40 is 1,600 tips in each square, and in total, they have 88 million gold squares on the surface. So 88 million gold squares, and each has 1,600, and you can now do the math. So you have millions of tips on the surface, and they can, you can use all that actually to write on the surface, and you can cover a large area. Okay, it's a good direction, but now, what do you think can be a problem with these kind of approaches? Tip goes bad, you have to, you know, just replace. Yeah, if one or maybe in certain area tip goes bad, or maybe a couple of tips goes bad, then uh, it's done. You cannot use that, right, for a lot of applications. So that's one of the biggest limitations. Uh, now the probability of a failure becomes much larger in this case, because now only not one tip, maybe 88 million, anything can go bad, and then you, that idea will not be readable, uh, writable. Uh, so yeah, that's the bigger, biggest problem. And then definitely if you want to make those many tips, there will be some variations. I think that can be controlled with the technology what we have. Uh, with some good variations, we would be able to actually have very similar size. But again, uh, the problem is if now the, on the surface, if some areas are uh, stiffer than the other areas, then again, there will be a problem. If there is non-uniform uh, rounding of a tip uh, or because of friction, again, that whole surface would be very, um, the, all the tips will not be very uniform. Uh, and again, there is a problem with this technique um, that it looks to me that uh, this whole package uh, seems to me very expensive. And you cannot use it for a lot of writing. Let's say you use it maybe for uh, one hour and then it not be usable, they're shown because of a rounding of the surface. So then getting a new, uh, tip of this kind 
uh, it will be expensive where you have many of them. But on the other hand, I was in dollar store and I was looking at, they, have, they are selling actually calculators of this size for one dollar. And I was surprised, and they can, you can do all the math, right? It has a plastic, it has a display, it has electronics, right? And you can uh, do simple math with it, look at the technology, and uh, definitely there are some uh, 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 the, uh, the transistors there which are doing the math and all the programming is done. And now with the labor cost and everything, everything comes up to $1 cost. So with the technology, when things grow, yeah, then this price can be, that's one example, can be actually reduced significantly. So that was actually interesting for me. Uh, and I was surprised, okay, we can really make things which are very novel, but with the, with the, the cost can be significantly reduced when you make it on a commercial scale. So yeah, that seems to be a big problem right now, uh, but I don't know how much cost it would take to make these kind of devices, but maybe that may be addressable. But right now, I don't see anything, any application where, based on my knowledge, where these kind of tips are used commercially. But they might find some applications somewhere, okay? So let's look at the paper. I'm just wondering how much time it has been cited since 2007. That would be interesting to see. Looks like this is a review paper, from where, but the other review paper might be a different one. Quite a few times from 2007, uh, 786. So yeah, it's a good. See, dip in lithography, 3,000 something. So this is a. These areas of research are very, very latest areas where people are right now working in the field. And so these are. This research will not 